Hello and welcome. This video looks at pseudocode. Before we get into it though, please can you do me a big, big favour. Please can you like this video and subscribe to my channel. I'd be really, really grateful and encourages me to do more of these videos. Thank you. Pseudocode isn't a programming language. It's written on paper, usually, or typed up, but you cannot run pseudocode. To get the code to work, you would actually trace it through. You trace through an algorithm, which we'll look at in a minute. So it's not really program code. Pseudo means indicating close deceptive resemblance. So it isn't actually programming language. In an exam, you'd have to be, have to be able to read and also write pseudocode. It's language independent and it's used for program design. So what happens is when we create programs, we write some pseudocode or we create a flowchart, then we might write some pseudocode. And what the pseudocode is doing is helping us to understand if the logic is going to work. And we understand if the logic is going to work by using a trace table and tracing it through. So we run, we do what's called a dry run of our code. Now we'll look at an example question from AQA. Now in this question, this is obviously exam, exam board based. AQA have a slightly different pseudocode to Edexcel. But in an exam, it wouldn't matter too much which exam board you've got, as long as you're not writing Python, and as long as you're not writing English statements with bullet points, as long as the logic works, you're going to get the marks. So we'll jump in and have a look at that question now. Question 12. Figure 13 shows an algorithm represented in pseudocode. A developer wants to check the algorithm works correctly. Line numbers are included, but not part of the algorithm. So here you see figure 13. 12.1. Complete the trace table from the algorithm shown in figure 13. Some values have already been entered. You may not need to use all the rows in the table. So we've got array indexing there, 0, C, 1, B, and 2, A. We've got I and J and temp. So we'll go and have a look at that for I from 0 to 1. So what we've got here is a nested loop for J from 0 to 1. So I and J start at 0. So then our condition on line 6, if ARR J plus 1 is less than ARR J, then temp becomes equal to ARRJ. So let's look, have a look at that then. So if ARRJ plus 1, which is B, because 0 plus 1 is 1, so that is B, is less than ARRJ, which is C, yes it is, then temp becomes equal to ARRJ. So temp is equal to C. Remember, it doesn't need to be numbers, it can be letters as well. You're looking in alphabetical order. That means in alphabetical order if it's less than. So A R R J, so at the moment that's element 0, becomes equal to A R R J plus 1. So what that means is A R R J, which is 0, becomes equal to the contents of A R R J plus 1, which is an element 1 there. So that becomes B. And A R R J plus 1, which is B, becomes equal to temp. So what was B is now equal to the contents of temp, which is C. So we go round again for J equals 0 to 1. So now J needs to be 1. And we will go into loop again. So if ARRJ plus 1, so that would be 2, is less than ARRJ, then let's go and check if that's true. So J plus 1 is 2, so that is A and AR. And J is C, A R J is C. So yes, that is true, so we'll go into that loop. So temp becomes equal to A R R J. So that is C, because we're looking at element one now, and that is C. A R R J becomes equal to A R R J plus one. So now A goes into A R R J, which is element one there of the array. A R R J plus one becomes equal to temp. So in temp there is C, and that now goes in ARRJ plus 1, which is element 2 of the array. Now, J is now 1, so we come out of that loop, and we go into the other for loop for I from 0 to 1. So now I becomes 1. And we go back to our program and have a look at what we need to do next. So we're going into this loop 
again for j from 0 to 1. So j now needs to go back to 0. So that I've placed 0 in j. So we're going back into the loop. So temp becomes equal to a r r j. So now look at element 0 of the array and we can see it contains a b. So we put b in temp like that. Line 8, ARRJ becomes equal to ARRJ plus 1. So that is ARRJ plus 1 is A. So ARRJ, which is 0, becomes equal to that there. And ARRJ plus 1 becomes equal to the contents of temp, which is B. So back into loop for J, 0 to 1. So now J becomes 1 like so. So now our test condition, if ARRJ plus 1 is less than ARRJ, then let's test that. So ARRJ plus 1 is actually element 2 there, which is contained, which contains C. So that clearly isn't less than ARRJ there, because C isn't less than B, then we don't need to, that is false, so we don't do any of the condition on line 7, 8, 9, we don't need to implement. So end if n4, n4, and that completes the trace table. So if we fill that in, we can see we've got we've gone from CBA to ABC. So that might help us with 12.2 to state the purpose of the algorithm. So that is to sort the values into alphabetical order. It's actually a bubble sort. 12.3, figure 13 has been included again below. So we can see figure 13 then. An earlier attempt at writing the alg algorithm in figure 13 had different codes for lines 4 and 5. Lines 4 and 5 of the pseudocode were for i from 0 to 2, for j from 0 to 2. Explain why the algorithm did not work when the value 2 was used instead of the value 1 on these two lines. Well, element 2 doesn't actually exist. So the alg algorithm will attempt to access an element in the array that does not exist. And that's the case because when it's looking at i plus 1 or j plus 1, that would actually be 3, which doesn't actually exist.